chapter 4, verses 5. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. At this time, I'd like to go to prayer. And before we do, I just want to ask you to keep in mind also, uh, uh, Melissa actually just texted me and said that she was out in the park and I had to leave. Her sister had just called with an emergency. Uh, she has an ulcer. She's being taken. She, she needs to get a ride to the hospital. So uh, if we just keep uh, the starts in prayer as well and her sister. Let's follow in prayer. The gracious Father, we have read a simple text from your scripture telling us there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And Lord, we know that as we study the name, the name which you gave your son, the name which you gave the whole host, your family in heaven, that name and the characteristics of that name, the power of that name, all that is about that name, Father, we know that we are also baptized into that name. So Lord, we ask that you would help us as we read from thy word tonight, that we might come to a better understanding of what it means to bear that name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now there's only one baptism, and that's is when the name is uttered over you. Actually, you hear Brother Brown he would say those things. He said there's only one baptism. Paul says there's one baptism. And yet, we baptize in water, and we're baptized in the Spirit. So, what we're looking at is when that name, it's all about the name. There's one baptism into that name. It's where you identify with the death of Jesus Christ, which is a dying to yourself. It's also when you go under the water representing the burial, being put away the old man, and then when we come forth, we come forth in newness of life, representing the resurrection, and you're being raised with him. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that was in Jesus, bearing the same name that he bore, living the same life that he lived, and when that, that same Spirit comes upon you and indwells you, you are endued with the same power that he was endued with, and therefore you are filled with the same Holy Ghost that he was filled with. It's all about the name. In Romans 6 and 3 we read, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are baptized with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead and by the glory of the Father, even so we also <coughs> should walk in newness of life. There's a complete identification in the Christian through that name. You know, we talk about baptism by water and then baptism of the Holy Ghost, but Paul says there is only one baptism, and that same Paul that says there's only one baptism said Israel was baptized in the Red Sea, and Israel was also baptized under the pillar of cloud, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10 and 2, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and, and to conjunction, like two things, and in the sea. And yet there's only one baptism, because there's only one baptizer. Now, what does this all mean anyway? We are not baptized into titles of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We are baptized into His name. And with the same name that He was baptized with, and with the same name that He lived with and expressed that life of His Father in, in whose name He was given birth in, and in that name He went forth declaring that life of the Father to mankind, we are baptized into that same name, and thus we are identified with the same person whose name we now bear. With the character that He possesses, we now possess. With the nature that he owns, we now own. And with the power that manifested in his life, we now manifest, or it is now manifested in ours. And therefore, the very baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ begins a transformation of each individual from sinner to son of God. Made in the image of the Father. As Brother Branham said, he became us so that we might become him. How many times does Brother Branham utter those words? For manifest the Son, just one of them, he says, and when we are born in the kingdom of God by Jesus Christ, we are heirs, uh, uh, we, we are an heir of heaven, joint heirs with Jesus, because we took our place, he took our place. He became us, sin, that we might become him, righteousness, see? He become me, that I might become him, see? Joint heirs with him, all right? Now remember, that's to each one of you. So we're not just dealing with the fact that there's just one William Branham that this thing happened to, but it happens in each one because we are believers. We're sons and daughters of God. Then when we are filled with the very same spirit that he was filled with, the very same life which he lived itself and expressed itself out in his life, we then must put on his life, the very same life, the very same way that he put on, and he expressed the Father's life. 
Remember, John 5, 26 says that, the, 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 that the, uh, the life is in the Father and was given unto his Son. We will, as Paul said, put on Christ. And when we have put on Christ, then we must, by the law of life, put on his very nature, his very character. And we are endued with his nature, and we have been endued with the very same power and authority that was given to him by his Father God, who also is our Father and our God. In Galatians 3.27, we read, For as many as you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I think, you know, amongst Christianity in both circles, whether you're Trinitarian or Oneness, Jesus only, they all have this thing about uh, baptism, and they're identified with a certain formula. But brothers and sisters, it's not the formula we're identified with. It's the name. It's the name. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. From souls in prison now, Brother Brown said, and he never left his body to see corruption. Neither did he leave his soul in hell. But he raised him up on the third day, and he's alive forevermore, and we will have a body like his own glorious body. That's why that we're baptized into his name, that we might come forth in his name, in his death, in his resurrection, that we rise again, testifying to the world that we have new life, that the old man is dead. We are buried, uh, we buried that first nature, see? That first nature is gone, and now we are the nature of him. He lives in us, and we don't, live, we don't do our own will. We do his will. We don't think our own thoughts. The mind is what thinks, and the mind that was in Christ is in every single believer. Then if we put on Christ when we were baptized with the Holy Ghost, and how can a person continue to commit wicked, wicked deeds after they put on Christ? That's just a question I have for everybody. I'm not targeting any person, especially you in here. I know you're all living good, godly lives. But my question to those across the entire message, across the entire Christendom, how can you continue to live like the old man when there's a new man that's supposed to be first inside of you? Tell me how the Spirit of Jesus Christ living in you can do those things. Tell me how the, how the Holy Spirit that lives itself out in the body of Jesus Christ and is now in you, how can His Holy Spirit living in you lie? How can His Holy Spirit that lives in you steal? How can His Holy Spirit that's living in you cheat? How can the Spirit of Christ living in you commit adultery or commit fornication? How can the Spirit of Christ living itself out in any of you do the deeds of the flesh that the Apostle Paul speaks about, which are the fruits of the flesh? And the answer is it can. So who are we fooling? You're certainly not fooling yourself. And you're certainly not fooling your spouse. And you're certainly not fooling your brothers and sisters. So who are you fooling? You're not fooling God. In Romans 7 and 5, he says, For when we were in the flesh, when we were focused on self, and were living for self, the motions of sin, the motions of unbelief, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So what the Apostle Paul says here is that when we are not born again, we are governed by self. And as such, we are self-centered. And when totally self-centered, then the fruits of the self, the fruits of the flesh, which was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, came forth in the world speaking lies, it governs self. And in Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul tells us about these works of self, these works of our flesh, so that we will bear them and die to them. He lets us know what they are so that we can identify when we see them, and thus we can die to them or not be fooled by it in others. Galatians 5, 19, Now the works of the flesh, the works of self, are manifest, which are these. Manifest. In other words, they're outward. It's not just a hidden sin. It's something that expresses itself. So we're going to see Paul categorize sin, which is unbelief, and he shows us by category the poles of the flesh that will manifest in those who live for self, rather than Christ living in you, or living your life for you. Because remember, eternal life is what? living for others. Now the first category he tells us is sexual depravity. 
And as Freud said, not that I agree with Freud and his conclusions, but the sexual drive is the first of all drives in man. The unregenerate man that I might add. And he will make he will take the order in which the, we're going to take the order in which the Apostle Paul takes. Mention him just the way he does. First adultery. That is when a person who is married to another commits fornication with another person who is married to another and not their own spouse. Or a person who is married commits fornication with someone who is not married, but he's married. And he's not married to that woman he's committing adultery with. Number two, fornication. That is sexual relationship outside of marriage. It's the same act as adultery, only adultery is when you do that act of fornication with someone who's not your own spouse. Number three, uncleanness. That means having a filthy mind. Your mind is in the gutter sexually all the time. We've all met people like that. You know, you, especially in business, you go out and every word out of their mouth is just some dirty joke. Lasciviousness. That means that you cannot contain your, your desire for sexual gratification. Notice that these first four fruits of the flesh, or of self, are all sexual in nature because they are geared to the physical senses and delight in the pleasures that physical senses produce. Now, if you wanted to, we could go into Freud, but I don't believe in getting into that stuff, but he, he labels them. There's four different stages of the sexual id, or in the id, of, of the sexual response. He says the first is where a baby, you know, actually uh, begins to do everything with their mouth. They, they, they uh, you know, they, they, they have to put everything in their mouth, and they have to do it because it's the senses. It's not, we're not talking about the sexual organs, we're talking about the senses. It's a sensate being. It's a, it's a sensualness. And it all begins with the mouth. And you know, it's funny because that's where the Word of God comes out of the mouth, and that's what they reject is the Word of God. So you can see the tie between them. And, and remember, we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come forth to the world speaking what? Lies. Lies. All right. So notice that these first four fruits of the flesh, or self, are all sensual in nature because they're geared to the physical senses and delights in the pleasure and the physical senses. In the next, Paul shows us how the same nature manifested as a wrong sexual drive also manifests itself in a wrong spiritual inclination or lean. Now he says, idolatry. And we know idolatry is defined as a worship or the adulation of something physical or some physical image or person. You know, people can adulize like they did with Obama. He's a person. And it was false worship. They were making pictures of him with halos behind his head or any, any circle icon behind him. If, whether it was a seal of the United States or, or whatever it was, they tried to get his lock, face lined up so that it looked like he had a halo around him. I just saw one of Ted Cruz the other day. He was standing in a Capitol and somebody saw the, the circle. So they got down and they took a picture of him with the circle around his head. Talk about idolatry. You see? Romans 1 and 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness or ungodlikeness and unrightwiseness of men who hold the truth in unrightwiseness. In other words, wrong error. I mean, wrong thinking. And remember, wrong thinking is a seed, right? So wrong thinking will produce wrong results. It will produce a wrong life. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, not even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imagination, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. <clears throat> In other words, these men are fully aware of God's decree. What decree? His righteousness, his right wiseness. Now you can't know his right wiseness unless you have been taught his right wiseness. These men have rejected that truth. They rejected that message when it came. They have turned away from it. Or well, maybe not outwardly, but they say, oh, we believe in God, but the God they, they, they believe comes from their own thinking, their own imagination, and they have totally rejected God's thinking, and therefore they've totally rejected God. So they worship the creature more than the creator. Now remember in our study of Brother Ram's message on Satan's Eden, this is years ago, maybe 20 years ago, we saw that Webster said the word worship comes from two words, worth, meaning and ascribe value and ship, which means the state or condition of it. 
In other words, these men have turned down the real message, the real decree, and have substituted their own version of what they think it should be based on their own lusts, their own desires. And they value more their own opinion of what God and his word or message are than what God himself says that they are. Therefore, idolatry is the worship or the placing a higher value upon the creation than on the creator himself. How many people in Pentecost <coughs> run around trying to prophesy over people? Hit or miss, hit or miss, hit or miss. How many people look at the word of God and when the word of God says, Thou shalt not do this, and they say, Well, you know what? He's a good God. You'll forgive me. I'll go ahead and do it anyway. No, you won't. I mean, you will. You'll go ahead and do You're going to do what you're going to do. You're going to do what you're ordained to do. But you're going to manifest also that you are not a believer. The Apostle Paul tells us how this idolatrous spirit in man will manifest itself openly through sexual deviancy. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to the uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed, and here's the key, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affection, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. What's he saying? Something Brother Bell told me in 1979. He said, Brian, every time they go off the word, it's got to go to sex. It did in the garden. And it will do it in their lives. And it won't fail. In other words, the idolatry leads to adultery always because it's the same spirit. When Eve wanted to be as wise as God, she thought that she would get there by turning aside what God had said to what the serpent had said, therefore holding the serpent's words a higher value than the very words of God. Thus, she had to turn aside from God's words in favor of the serpent's words. And when she did, it led to sex with the serpent. Idolatry always leads to adultery because adultery is the same act in the flesh as idolatry is in the spirit. A man holds a higher regard for another woman than his own wife. Worship, a higher value, the state or being, or the state, the state of another, a state or being of another, of a higher value, right? So he looks at this woman, oh, she's prettier than my wife. So he holds that as a higher value, and therefore he commits adultery. That's the same thing, it's idolatry. You hold to the words of a man who does not have thus saith the Lord, that's idolatry. It's the same spirit, motivated by the same inner id. The greed of the human being, of the, of, the, of the serpent nature, let's put it that way. Therefore, idolatry takes place in any form or in anything that holds a higher value than they do the value of God's word. And in the New Age movement and in the occult worship, they use objects in their worship of Satan, and they do not even think that they are worshiping Satan in doing so. Remember, idolatry is adulation. And when you use those Ouija boards and pendulums and, and, and that some people use to make their decisions with, or in the form of a Ouija board, or in going to a palm reader, or using tarot cards, or tarot cards, or however you pronounce it, what they're saying in, in, in effect is, I have more confidence in going to these things to get my decisions on what to do than I have in going to the Holy Ghost himself. And what have they done? They placed a higher value on those things. That's idolatry. I don't care what way they, 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 they I, don't, I don't care how they put it. I don't care if they say, well, scientifically it can be proven. Hogwash. When you place anything above the Word of God, that thing becomes an idol. Brother Ram said, if you let another person get between you and God, that person is closer to God than you are. So the idol becomes closer to God than you. So you've got to go through the idol to get to God. And how many people go through their pastor to get to God? Or go through another man and get to God. You've got to be able to go to God direct. He's your father. Hallelujah. I can show you many quotes from Brother Bell himself said, Adultery is a type of idolatry. Now from the seventh seal, Brother Ram said, Therefore, if any man will serve an idol or keep an idol on him, keep an idol on him. What's that? Well, the Catholic Church, what do they have? It's called a scapula. Remember that, Sister Helena? A scapula. Peter, remember those? Maybe they had a fingernail from Peter. <laughs> not, not this Peter. <laughs> Although your fingernail might have gotten in that, right? <laughs> or they had a hair or something. They, they claimed. You know, they, they went and dug up graves and got all kinds of bones and everything else to put in these things. That thing is an idol. The statues, they come and they kneel down before that is an idol. 
you kneel down before these pictures, that's an idol. It's an idol. If any man will serve an idol or keep an idol on him, Brother Bram said, or bless himself in his own imagination of his mind and serve idols, like what? A rabbit's foot. How many Catholics carry a uh, crucifix or, or carry a picture of, uh, of St. Christopher when they go on a trip? They hang it in the car. You see? God said, man, woman, family, or tribe, his name will be completely blotted out from among the people. I'm sure glad that when I had a scapula, I, was, I did it in ignorance. I was just a kid. But I turned from all that filthiness. Now, he says, is that right? How true, idolatry did the same thing in the church years ago and does today. And now notice, watch how the Antichrist tried to make an anti-move. How many knows that the devil types and patterns after God's things? So what is sin? Is right thing perverted. What is a lie? It is a truth misrepresented. What is adultery? It is a right act, a legal act done wrong. See? Again, from reaction to an action, Brother Bram said, and Ahab had knuckled down to his idolatrous wife, and it brought all Israel into idolatry. And you say, well then, Brother Branham, you compare it to today to our nation. Yes, sir, our nation is great is greatly covered over with idolatry. Now think of it. Think of it. When they turned down the word, took the word out, took, took God out of the schools, took the word of God out of the pulpits, he stands there knocking. When this nation rejected God, what did they do? They turned to ch ch uh, child, uh, uh, what do you call it? child sacrifice. Just like Moab. Moab, they went and they burnt the children. What do they do today? They, they abort them and they burn them. When I was so greedy, they bore them and they settled parts. <clears throat> the same spirit. Our nation is greatly covered over with idolatry. We might not worship wooden animals and so forth, as we want to think of idolatry, but that's not all idolatry consists of. We sometimes make our automobiles and our clothes. And the things that we do, we put as idols. Anything between you and God is an idol. I want us to just focus on that. I wish I could just really blow that up and do super big resolution right there because I want everybody to walk out of here knowing one thing tonight. Anything you put between you and God, I don't care if it's a pastor, if it's a teacher, if it's a five-fold ministry, even if it's a prophet, if you put anyone, anything between you and God, that thing has become an idol to you. Sometimes we make our churches idols, he says. We should never do that. God is the only one we should worship. Again, what's the definition of worship? Worth and ship. Worth being a value that you place, and ship being the act or state of being. In other words, if you put a higher value to the church, than you put to the Lord Jesus Christ, His Word. No matter what it is. You put a higher value to what... Uh, a, a, a pastor tells you that what an indicated prophet because that's God's direct word that's worship I mean that's idolatry you put it to a teacher then to a vindicated prophet that's idolatry the very thing God gave the children of Israel to bless them became an idol he gave them the, 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 the serpent on the pole right God gave it to them is that not right he said if you look upon this What's going to happen? They'd be saved from the fiery serpents that were coming, right? It become a uh, it become an idol, and Moses had to destroy that thing. You lift up a man, and God will have to take the man down. Please, please, I beg of you, never do that to me. And I, I, I mean, I'm not worthy to have you think of that to me. But don't ever get to that place where you think of me as something special like that. I'm your brother. We're all brothers in Jesus. Now from the Smyrna church age, Brother Brown said, he, he defined idolatry as spiritual fornication. He wrote, idolatry which is spiritual fornication. I just took part of the text, but you can read it for yourself. All right, from the church age book, also for gaming church age, he says, so when these people were bowing to the images, lighting candles, using pagan holidays, confessing their sins to men, all of which belonged to the devil's religion, they were partakers with the devil and not of the Lord. They were in idolatry whether they admitted it or not. 
They can talk all they want to, that the altars and the incense are only to remind them of the prayers of the Lord, or whatever they think it means. In other words, you can, you can excuse yourself in your activities with all the logic that you can muster up, but it's still idolatry. They can say what they want. When they pray before the image, it is just for the sake of emphasis. And that when, the, and when they confess to the priest, it is really to God that they're, that they're doing it in their hearts to. And when they say the priest forgives them, it is just that he is doing it in the name of the Lord. They can say what they want to, but they are partaking in the well-known Babylonian satanic religion and have joined themselves to idols and committed spiritual fornication, which means death. They are dead. Pretty strong words. No wonder people don't like the church age book. I love it. So we have no doubt that idolatry is considered a fornicating spirit by God's prophet. And we see that the Apostle Paul lists the sexual sins first, then the spiritual sins that have the same fornicating nature, i.e. idolatry. Now notice, <clears throat> right after he mentions idolatry, he mentions, the Apostle Paul mentions next witchcraft. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Galatians 5, because we're going to look at, we're going to be studying these one at a time as we go along. And let me just uh, scan back to let you know what verse that was. Galatians um, 20. Yeah, okay, we're, we're at 19, now we're up to 20. <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> right after he mentions idolatry, he mentions witchcraft. Now it's interesting that the Greek word for witchcraft is pharmakia, where we get our English word pharmaceutical. And so the use of pharmaceuticals to enhance your body or to enhance your spirit is called witchcraft. Today, you know, men want to be lovers, so they take Viagra. That's witchcraft. People get uh, their, their minds all in a, in, a, in, a, in a stupor, so they take drugs to try to straighten out their mind. They take, uh, what do they call those things, uh, neur neural, uh, what do they call that, the things that mess up people's mind, like Prozac and stuff. Antidepressants. Antidepressants. When they should be going to Christ, ease our peace, you see. All right, anyway, they substituted him as being our peace for something to pull to you. That has become an idol. That is placed between them and God. All right. This nation has one of the highest dependencies on drugs more than any other nation in the world. Therefore, this nation is involved in witchcraft more than any other nation on earth because that's the root word for a kid. And notice what witchcraft produces in your soul. The next category Paul describes as attributes of the flesh are those attributes that are produced by idolatry and by witchcraft. First of all, this hatred, which is defined in the Bible as hostility by implication, a reason for opposition, enmity, en enmity, and hatred. Therefore, you can expect those with a sinful nature and an unbelieving nature who are into idolatry to show hatred and hostility to those who would oppose their sin. Next, Paul places in this list of sinful nature, he calls it variance. Now, when we think of the word variance, we think of the difference between this and this. Well, actually, the word variance is defined as a quarrelsome nature. In other words, you, you, you probably said to yourself, you know, oh, that person just likes to be different. You know, they're always, they're always trying to be different. See? By implication, wrangling, contention, debate, strife, variance. What's wrangling? Any you guys wear Wrangler jeans? You know what that's about? The cowboy, he wrangles the, the, the you know, he gets on, he, he, he ropes the, uh, the, the, the cow, he wrestles the cow down, you know, fussing, fighting, you know, just taking them by the whole horns or whatever. Wrangling, contention, debate, strife, and variance. In other words, they are not satisfied to let others be different, but they become meddlesome in other people's business, and they become contentious towards those who do not agree with their line of thinking. 
What I've never been able to understand in this message is why people can't just let people be people. And why we get upset if somebody else doesn't believe? Why should I get upset if somebody doesn't believe? I shouldn't. You should. Let them be what they're... Look, Brother Brown said, people will do what they're ordained to do. You can't change them. So love them anyhow. How many got a pet? A dog? A cat? Anybody in here? You love the dog? You know, in the Bible, you couldn't pay tithes on the sale of a dog. But you love him anyhow, right? Hey, Brother Graham's dog and his horse are going to be up there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Huh? So, anyway. In other words, they are not satisfied to let others be different, but they become meddlesome in other people's business. They become contentious towards those who do not agree with their line of thinking. In other words, always trying to prove the other person to be serpency, 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 because one more off is Satan's kingdom. And so if they don't believe it the way I see it, they're serpency. Well, what made us the judge? The next word Paul used to describe the sinful, self-absorbed nature is emulations. Now, emulations is defined in the Bible as an en enemy, malice, emulation, envy, fervent mind, indignation, zealous, zealous, and zeal. I mean, jealousy and zeal. Notice how it is full of malice or indignation towards others. Just, there's a built up, they want to fight, they want to strike. You know, there's something that just agitates them. Why? Why do people get agitated over what somebody does that they don't like? Do you go up to the next door neighbor and get agitated because they don't shovel their walk the way you want it shoveled? It's their walk. Then why, sisters, would you get agitated with your husband if he eats peas with a knife? Honestly. Your job is to raise your kids not to eat peas with a knife. But don't change the husband. If his mother didn't do it, you're not his mother. <laughs> anyway. Notice how it's full of malice and indignation towards others. It's this jealous, it's an envious, jealous spirit that slew most of the prophets thinking they were doing God a service. You know, I'll have to just add this. Being that we've traveled a lot overseas, it used to really kind of twerk my mind when I'd see the brothers in Australia or New Zealand or in England, and they put their forks upside down when they ate. And they ate with two utensils in their hand. Because, you see, we were taught, you know, we had, uh, what was the woman that Brother Ram always talked about? She, she was a woman that told you how to do things. Uh, not Dear Abby, but somebody like that. And uh, anyway, so we were taught, you know, that, uh, you know, you take your, you know, you put your, well, anyway, we put our, we put our utensils on the opposite hand of what we use, which is really strange. And then we pick them up and we, we, we cut, and we were supposed to put the thing down and then shift hands, put it in your mouth. And then I see the people from Australia, New Zealand, England, they stab it, saw it, and put, use the same hand. And they had the fork upside down. And I would think, well, the fork's upside down, and everything's going to fall off. No, because they stabbed it. You know, or they feel the back side. You see, and so, if you're carnal, you look at those things, and it bugs you. But you know what? I found, uh, to be honest with you, I eat that way now. <laughs> anyway. Just to show you, you know, just, I mean, I'm, I'm making a kind of a simple comparison. But sometimes we have our little niches, our standards that we've set, or that our mother set for us. Like my mother used to say, 20 chews before you swallow. You know, how many people chew their food 20 times before they swallow? You know, and, 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 and we think that is the ultimate. There's only one ultimate, and that's thus saith the Lord. Brother Adam said, I like cherry pie, my wife likes apple pie, or vice versa. Does that mean she's out of it because she likes the different pie that he likes? No. You see, God has many different children. And, 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 and every one of us has a whole different set of the DNA of God than what the next guy has. In other words, we might have some things similar, like, like I have three daughters, and, and they have some things that are like that. They have other things that are different. And that's the way God's kids are. Every one of us is given a measure that Jesus had at all. So out of malice and jealousy comes forth wrath, he says. 
Paul tells us, and wrath is a fierce indignation. And it leads to strife, which is a very contentious disposition, always fussing and disputing with others. And then the apostle adds to the list seditions, which literally means disunion, i.e. figuratively dissension, division, sedition. In other words, a separating of self from others for the smallest of reasons. How many husbands and wives divorce over the stupidest little things? How many husbands and wives get into arguments over the stupidest little things? Stupid stuff. But they do it anyway. Why? It's the flesh. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come forth the world speaking lies. They need to die to self. And let, this, let, let God do their life for them. And then the Apostle Paul adds to the list additions, disunion, dissensions, divisions, sedition. In other words, to separate himself from others, and they don't do it in a nice way. They do it in a very mean spirited attacks on those whom they separated from. What? To justify themselves, to justify their sedition. To justify their separation, to justify the division, the, the dissension. And then Paul, in the same list, he adds heresies. Now heresy seems like it's completely different, but what the word heresy means, it not only means false beliefs, but the word has a more striking definition in that it suggests those who are such want to get together with others of like-mindedness to form a sect of their own. Paul said, of your own selves, the rise brethren who lead people off after themselves. It's, it's all about self, because that's the spirit, that's the fruits of flesh. The fruits of the flesh are the fruits of self. That's how the Greek word actually defines heresy. Then Paul lists many other attributes that manifest in the life of those persons who are void of God's spirit, such as envy. Now, envy is ill will coming out of jealousy, and then murders. And we know that Brother Branham said there's more ways to murder that, a man than with a bullet or a knife. He said, you can speak against a person's character, and you might as well have stabbed him in the back. In fact, in the English language, we have the expression, being stabbed in the back, when we speak of a person committing character assassination. Now, from the testimony of true witness, Brother Brown said, and any one of the very first signs of Christianity refused to kill a man. So one of the first signs of Christianity is that you refuse to kill a man. That's right. And you can kill him more ways than just sticking him with a knife. Speak against his character many ways that you can do it. Now, if you still got the desire in you to kill, you got to die to that, brother, sister, because that's not Christian. That's not Christ's life. He died to save. It. In Hebrews 7, part 2, and you people with these saw blade tempers that's always spouting off in the mouth at somebody, can't put up and things like that, be careful. You're guilty if you speak a word against your brother that's not right and it's not just. Go around and tear down. You don't have to stick a man. Uh, with a knife in, in the back to kill him. You can break his character and kill him. Kill his influence. Speak against your pastor here. Say something about, bad about him. You just uh, might as well have shot him. Told something that wasn't right about him. Well, it'll kill his influence with the people. Things like that. And you're guilty of it. Like Jesus said. <clears throat> a lot of people are going to be guilty of murder. Unless we get it all under the blood. Start living like we're supposed to live. Then the Apostle Paul warns us further of our attributes that will manifest in the life of the unbeliever, such as drunkenness. What is drunkenness? It's a separation of the mind. I mean, it's, it's a distancing of the mind from the reality. In other words, when a person is drunk, they're not in full control. Revelings and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. Wow. And you know what? You know what is a bigger wow? Is that God's going to test you in those things. He already has. I think most of us have already failed. But I, I wouldn't say most, I'd say all. We've all failed. So we need to die. Die to self. Let Christ in your life for us. When Ram had an idiom in his house, he said, if you can't say something good about somebody, just don't say it. Learn to bite the tongue. What we need is calloused tongues. Full of being bit. Every time you open your mouth to say something that you shouldn't say. <clears throat> then the Apostle Paul warns us 
Excuse me. So we, we see the attribute that exposes the very nature of the unregenerate person who, if they not repent, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fortunately, we do have the blood. But you can't say, I'm going to put that under the blood and then go out and do it. You put something under the blood when you've fallen. Not because you willfully did it, because you unwillfully got led into a trap. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then the Apostle Paul tells us what attributes are manifest in those who are filled with the Spirit of Christ. 22. But the, fr the fruit of the Spirit, first of all, he says, is love. And love is always expressed in Scripture by giving. Love as eternal life is expressed in living for others. And yet love is not soapy. It's not, you know, mushy-mushy. Uh, love is corrective. But love is doing for others what you would not normally do. Then the Apostle Paul names the second attribute of being filled with the Spirit, and he says, and it's joy. Love and then joy. How can you not have joy when you're in love? Huh? When you're in love, you're full of joy. Is that right? Well, Brother Brandon in a sermon, all the days of our lives, he said, I believe that the Christian life is a continual sacrifice. He that will come after me, let him deny himself daily. Every day, not 46 days, but every, or 4 to 6 days, four, yeah, 46 days, but every day. Take up his cross and follow me, said Jesus. Not just 46, but every day. Christian life is one continual Lenten. What's Lenten? That's a Catholic term for the 40 days between, or is it 50 days? Yeah, 50 days between Easter and Pentecost, right? All right, Lent. What do they do in Lent? Everybody gives up something. Brother Branham. It's kind of funny, but Brother Branham says, Christian life is, is one continually Lenten. Oh, how the Christian loves to do it. He, does, he, he doesn't do it with a grudge. He does it with a feeling that he loves God and he's glad that he can do it. It's a joy to serve the Lord. It's a joy to sacrifice. It's a joy to worship the Lord. It's a joy to be called a fanatic for the kingdom of God's sake. It's a joy to take a stand for the right and move from the wrong. It's a joy to praise Him. It's a joy to abstain from the things of the world. It's in, the, it's in their heart. It's a perfect Lent. Lent it all the time. God's Spirit comes into you and it changes your desires. And the Apostle Paul tells us where our joy comes from. He says in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 2.19, For what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing. Are not you even in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his perusia? That should be our greatest joy, is being in his presence. So if we're truly walking in his presence, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, it will bring us into fellowship with him, and those who are fellowshipping with him, and it will cleanse us from all our unbelief, then how can you not have joy in your heart? Having fellowship with Him, having fellowship with one another, knowing that your sins are being cleansed. How can you not then be in a state of joy while in His presence? And then when you're in a state of joy, you're not negative. You ever been in a state of joy and negative at the same time? It's two different poles. You are not taking offense to everything the devil throws through his anointed ones, throws your way. You're not down in the dumps because you're focused on his presence. And if we could all come to the place where we realize it is the devil's job to distract you from this joy that comes from God's presence, then we would not allow ourselves to enter into that distraction. Remember Brother Branham. The person said, oh, Brother Brown, they're saying this about your mother, so I'll just forget it. They said, Brother Brown, that, 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 that pertains to you. And he said, listen, if I was always distracted by these things, always looking over, he said, I wouldn't have my eyes on the end of the room. I'd be falling all the time. But I've got my eyes set on Calvary, and I've got my eyes set on the end. Listen, brother, sister, we, we should have our eyes set on one thing. Being conformed to the image of the firstborn son. That's our promise for this hour. To be adopted, to be joint heirs with Christ, to be manifested as sons of God. That's our focus. And we can only do that by walking in His presence as He walked in His presence. 
When Peter was focused on Christ, he walked on water himself. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he looked at the distractions of the waves, what happened? He sank. Then the apostle Paul speaks of another attribute of those who are spirit-filled. He says, peace, love, joy. If you have love and joy, how can you not have peace? And this is not the peace that the world can give you. But it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. And the word peace means quietness and rest. In other words, tranquility. Tranquility. Mothers, think about that. If the kids are doing something and it's not unscriptural, peace, sister. Okay? Don't raise your roof over things that are not scripturally based. Now let me read some things to you about where our peace comes from and why it is so important for us to walk in peace. First of all, we find out that our God is a God of peace. For he is our peace. In 2 Thessalonians 3.16, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace. Always, by all means, the Lord be with you all. Philippians 4, 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. I think in this day we could say the same thing with William Brown. The things that you learn by watching his life, watching what he did, the things that you received and heard and seen in him, do. Because he was the closest thing to Jesus Christ that we'll ever see this side of the resurrection. Ephesians 2.14 For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. 1 Corinthians 14.33 For God is not the author of confusion but he's the author of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Therefore, if our God is a God of peace, because He is peace, our peace, then when we receive His Spirit, we should then be graced by this wonderful attribute of Him that expresses His God life in us, and that is peace. I would rather a church that is so in love with Jesus Christ, so full of joy because of that love, and so at peace, I'd rather that than any other thing you could think of. Because then you'd have harmony between God and man. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me <coughs> you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Picture in your mind. Jesus is asleep in the boat while the whole world is in tribulation around him. The waves are roaring. The water is coming down. The storms are there. The winds are there. Everything is, is lightning and thunder and everything else. And the, the apostles are petrified. And he's sleeping. Like a young child sleeping through a tornado. And the tornado picks up the entire crib, like what happened here in 1995 or something like that, uh, down, down by Fields Road. Took the whole house up, took the child in his crib, set it down two blocks away from the house. The child was still in the crib. The peace of God passes all our understanding. Therefore, as he said, in me you might have peace. So if we're living outside of Christ, we cannot expect to find this peace, this rest, this quietness. In fact, we read in Isaiah 30 and 15, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. In quietness and confidence. But he says, but you would not. We don't want quietness. We don't want peace. We want to have our way. But that's not God's way. Notice, and you would not. Why is it when God presents to us a solution that will benefit our life, why does man always turn it down? He tells us in quietness and confidence we will have strength. He says, sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. 
Brother Brown said, there's one thing you can't do enough of. What is that? Pray. Pray. We all know it. Why don't we do it? There's one thing you can't do enough of, and that's pray. He said, you can eat too much. There's a lot of evidence of that in this room tonight. He said, you can, you can talk too much. There's a lot of evidence in this message and in this church of that. But he said, there's one thing you can't do enough of, and that is pray. Why? Because when you get alone, and you get on your knees before God, in quietness, in quietness, there's a peace that takes place. When the whole world is turbulent, when the family is turbulent, when the kids are turbulent, when the plumbing is out, how about we get to our knees first before we try to tackle the job? How many times I have tried to do something myself and I couldn't get it done, could, I, I, you know, and, and you know what? I stop and pray, and all of a sudden, trying to turn a bolt, turn a bolt, and the thing keeps stripping off, and I pray. Next time I put it up there, it just comes right off. Well, <coughs> He is our peace. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, Paul says, when I admit that I'm weak, then he is strong. When I admit that I can't do it, then he'll do it for me. Therefore, knowing that God is a God of peace and he wishes for us to be at peace with him and at peace with each other, then we must empty ourselves of self and allow his spirit to free reign within us to manifest his peace. In 2 Peter 1 and 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. How? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Just when you're in a tumult, get away from everything. Open your Bible and read how Jesus responded when he was at the point of crucifixion. When he finally went inward and said, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Romans 5 and 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, finally, brother, farewell. Be perfect, that means complete, finish off, fully equipped. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, and live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. You live in peace, and the God of peace will be with you. Hallelujah. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men, not just the believers. All men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Colossians 3, 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body and be you thankful. Just a few more on the post. Philippians 4 and 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 7, 15. But if the unbelieving departs from this, let him depart. And brother or sister, a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. As I mentioned before, I talked to Brother Collins, I said, you know, you know, he told me, people at the church, I said, well, Brother Collins, how do you handle it? He said, well, I said, do you go after him? He said, no, we just let him go. He said, I said, why? He said, well, because if we went after them, if they're not happy, then they're not going to be happy here in the church. It's going to a little lead lead a whole lot. They want to go and let them go. We just pray for them. That someplace they'll find that they can be happy. That's the attitude we should take. Don't pray that God just smack them down, make them, you know, come back to church. No, God, help them to find some place that they can be happy. I'll tell you why. It works two ways. Number one, if they're not God's seed, then the only piece of heaven they're going to have is this side of the resurrection. So God, please give them 
to some peace here. You understand? And if they are not seed, then we pray for the best anyway. We should pray for everybody's best. Romans 4.19, let us therefore follow after all things which you make for peace, and think we're with one another. What does it mean to edify? To build up? To help? Let us follow there, therefore after the things which you make for peace. In other words, let's not be saying things that cause a division, cause strife, cause contrariness. Let's say things in a way which will make for peace. Romans 14, 17. Now listen, doesn't mean you have to compromise where you stand. Doesn't mean you have to you have to give in to their unbelief. Simply means let go and let God. You're not their judge. He's the supreme judge. Let him do if they're his child, Brother Brown said, if they leave, if they're if they're God's child and they leave the word, God will either take them off the scene or he'll make he'll bring the correction. And if they don't take the correction, he said he'll take them off the scene. That's his business. Right? For the kingdom of God, verse 14, 17, is not in meat, not in grace, but righteousness, right? Wise and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We all think of getting to heaven where there's going to be supreme peace and joy. We all look forward to that. But did you know that we are now sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Mm -hmm. If we are in his presence, there should be that same peace. Because the attitude you have here is what you're going to have over there. The character you have here is that's the only thing you're taking with you. God wants us to be in that condition before we get there. He doesn't want to have to reprimand us and, and, and you know, beat the snot out of us over there. That's what he's doing here. He wants us to come to the place where we're, when we all get there, we are at peace and rest. Listen. Not just peace with one another, peace with yourself. Because you find most people that are, 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 are always braiding, they're not peace with them. They don't have peace with themselves. If they had peace with themselves, they would have peace with others. You get the peace here. Don't worry about the next time. Get that peace here. Get peace in your soul for yourself. Then maybe that will rub off and reflect over to them. Romans 8 and 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And James 3.18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Let's bow our eyes in prayer. Father, you said the fruit of righteousness is sown in them that make peace. Help us, O oh God, to be peacemakers. Help us, O oh God, not to be so dogmatic in the way that we live or the way that we the, the doctrine that we hold on to we're not asking you Lord to allow us to compromise we don't want to do that Father we want to stand with you but we don't want to be so hard headed so striving that we lose our own peace our own joy in the Holy Ghost so Father help us to have that critical balance. And it all comes from being focused. Focused on you. Focused on our relationship. Not my pastor's relationship. Not my wife's relationship. My children's relationship. But my relationship with you. And when each of us can come to that place where we know that we know because it's in our heart. And we have sweet communion with thee that I believe that we'll be ready to come together in one lovely family. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The brothers will bring forth the elements at this time. We have a song, My Peace I Give Unto Thee.